Hey, welcome back for more Bio 276. So today we're going to talk about nervous systems and animals. So here's what we're talking about, and then the objectives for today. So last time we looked at membrane potentials and action potentials, and the role of the sodium potassium pump in, in creating what we call a charge gradient, or excuse me, a concentration gradient, and then the leakage of potassium ions, which creates that negative inside, and that sets up the con or the charge gradient. And with their powers combined, we have a member or resting membrane potential of about negative 70 millivolts. And action potentials turn out to be when we can manipulate this membrane potential. Only excitable tissues are capable of doing action potentials. And it's a combination of a depolarization, which is when sodium enters into the cell, which turns it from negative to positive, and then we have a repolarization, which is when the cell goes back to being negative, and that's due to the movement of potassium ions. And we also looked at how we can make this action potential move along and eventually reach the end of a synapse, or reach the synapse, and then we release neurotransmitters. So when we have those neurotransmitters being released, the question is, well, what do you do with all that information? And it turns out, the neurotransmitters are going to do one of two things. They're either going to open up sodium gates or potassium gates. At least, very simply, those are going to be the two things that they can do. There are actually other options, but we're going to only focus on these two. Unlike how most people think of it, which is you have one neuron, then it goes to interacting with one other neuron, and then you know, the signal gets sent out. It's not really like that. You actually have hundreds of these interactions going on. And the question is, well, what signals turn out to win out? Because not all neurotransmitters are going to secrete or release excitatory neurotransmitters. Some of them are going to release inhibitory neurotransmitters. So how do you know what happens? And ultimately, there are two different methods that are used by neurons. And it's not like, oh, well, under these circumstances, this is the method that they use. And in other circumstances, this is the method that they use. It kind of just depends. And I'm not enough of a neuroscientist to be able to tell you specifics beyond that. The two options that we have are called summations. So we have either... Spatial summation or temporal summation. Spatial summation is when the volume of the neurotransmitter is the important bit. Meaning, if I secrete 100 excitatory neurotransmitters and 50 inhibitory neurotransmitters, then the excitatory wins. But if you were to flip this and you were to do 100 you know, inhibitory neurotransmitters and 50 excitatory neurotransmitters, then the inhibitory one wins. So it's, it's a volume game. Another option that exists is a temporal summation, meaning it's the timing. Which one is fired when released more frequently? And it's the frequency that's important, not the volume. So if it, you know, you it's being... If you're secreting an inhibitory neurotransmitter once every 10 milliseconds as opposed to once every second, it's the once every 10 milliseconds that wins out. With these synapses between these neurons, it turns out that we like to think of, oh, well, it's a wiring problem and the wiring just stays put. That's actually not true. The wiring has a degree of what we call plasticity. That is, it can change on you, which is a literal rewiring of your brain. Whenever you have learning, whether that's short-term or long-term, it is a alteration of the wiring of your brain. And we know that this wiring happens throughout time. It actually is part of development. It's why you can handle more abstract ideas the older you get, and that's because your brain is being rewired and can handle it. But when you're younger, you can't handle those type of abstractions because your brain is not set up to do that. 
This is also one of the things that happens when you get older, and that is you get rid of wiring as well. If you don't need to keep you know certain pathways around because there's skills that you don't need to use, then you get rid of it. So if you've ever heard that phrase, use it or lose it, it's actually legitimately true. One of the things that we do to reinforce learning is it's the synapse. So the more often a certain synapse is used, that will reinforce that that is a good wiring problem to have. What's also used to reinforce everything is myelin. The more you utilize a particular pathway, the more you will myelinate it to make it more efficient. When we look at this plasticity, the oldest parts of your nervous system usually are the ones that develop first and they don't change as much. It's the newer parts of the new nervous system, so parts of your brain that are associated with thinking that are usually the most sensitive to this plasticity. So environmental factors can easily start to change what's going on there. When we look at how neurons are all grouped together, we can cluster them into groups that we call nervous systems. And there are evolutionary patterns to what we see, when we look at cnidarians, what we tend to see are what we call nerve nets, which are just a big, massive, intertangled web of neurons. We get something similar when we look at echinoderms, where we'll get a nerve ring and then some radiating nerves, but there's no like central location of control. The term ganglia, which is plural for ganglion, is a cluster of cell bodies. And what we tend to see as we move through evolutionary time is a push towards ganglia. And in particular, you can get ganglia that build up into large masses. We call those masses brains. So a brain is a really large ganglion. So much so that it's kind of like a bunch of them all together. So we look at planarians, so we look at you know, platyhelminths, they have brains. If we look at annelids, they have brains. If we look at insects, they have brains. Uh, chitons, they're more back at that nerve net, but still they have ganglia, so it's like primitive brain-ish. Definitely with uh, cephalopods, and when we look at vertebrates, there's definitely a brain there. So we see this push towards this localization of all of this nervous tissue. It's also sometimes called cephalization. The creation of a head, which is just this one spot where a lot of nervous tissue is building up. If I look just at vertebrates, what we can do when we look at the vertebrate brain is we can break it into three chunks. The forebrain, which is the evolutionary new part, the midbrain, and then you have the hindbrain. As I look at vertebrates going from lampreys to mammals, not saying that mammals are the end-all be-all, but they're newer on the scene than lampreys are. As we look at this evolutionary development, what we tend to see is a buildup of the forebrain. So the forebrain is getting larger, and that means proportionately the hindbrain is smaller. So we're seeing this proportionate shift between these two. That doesn't necessarily make one more advanced, it just makes them different. So when I look at the vertebrate nervous system, we tend to divide it up in a few different ways. The ways that you have probably heard of this is the anatomical division of the vertebrate nervous system, which we call either the CNS, the central nervous system, or the PNS, or the peripheral nervous system. Quite simply, the central nervous system is brain and spinal cord. And then the peripheral nervous system would be everything else, which is to say uh, nerves. There actually is a weird little side system that's in there that falls under the peripheral, but it kind of functions on its own, so it's kind of really weird. And that's called the enteric nervous system, 
or the enteric system. This is your intestines or your digestive tract. And I don't happen to know too much about it. Um, it's not a, I'm sure it's a increasing field of study, but it's one of those where there's so much going on inside your intestines that it needs its own set of coordination. Your brain and spinal cord aren't enough. So it has, like I said, its own little version of what's going on. So the anatomical divisions are easy. I can point at something and say, oh, that's central. That's peripheral. If I then ask you, what does it do? You say, I don't know. That, that's hard. We can also divide up your nervous system by looking at its function, so the physiology. The somatic nervous system is responsible to conscious control. So this will be you having thoughts and controlling muscles, whereas the autonomic has un- conscious control. It is more automatic. Well, I can understand those things, but if I were to say, where do you find these, you'd have a really hard time finding the somatic and the autonomic. So when we look at our organization, you kind of need to pick what you want to talk about. Do you want to talk something simple to find, but hard to explain what it does, or something easy to explain what it does, but you're going to have a devil of a time finding it? Hmm. Here's a different way of viewing all of this in terms of dividing it all up. I don't know if I would necessarily agree with how this figure shows things, especially because aspects of the autonomic nervous system have something to do with your central nervous system. So I, I don't know if this is a smart choice, especially because some of the cell bodies that are utilized here are found within the central nervous system. So there's a little bit of issue with some of this. Uh, like aspects of the motor control system, which is somatic, is also found in the central nervous system. So there, there's some questions with this figure. So when I look at the somatic, so again, this is the part that you get conscious control over. Typically, we can think of brain parts this way. So when I look at the brain, and obviously you can also deal with this as being, you know, central nervous system too. When we look at the brain, it's broken up quite generally into what we call gray matter and white matter. Gray matter is going to be associated with cell bodies. And the white matter would be the axons. And in particular, you're looking at myelin. The source of this myelin turns out to be from oligodendrocytes. We also happen to notice when we look at the brain that there's all these folds. And we'll worry in lab what these folds are called and all that fun stuff later. But we see a lot of these folds. And the thing about lots of folds is if I have lots of folds, I have increased surface area. If I have increased surface area, I have increased function. The processing of nervous tissue occurs on the cell bodies. So if I have lots of folds, I'm going to have lots of processing space. It's going to be similar in the spinal cord. The catch with the spinal cord is the position of gray and white matter is flipped. The gray matter is actually in the middle and white matter is on the outside. Looking at the brain itself, we divide it up into a whole bunch of regions. So we have this forebrain, which is actually, embryologically speaking, called the telencephalon and the diencephalon. In lab, we'll, deal, we'll worry more about what these words really mean. The cerebrum is the part that you think of as the brain, but there's actually more than just that. The diencephalon is more of a relay center and it's sensory integration and trying to figure out what's going on with various measurements going around in your body. And the brainstem is there to keep you alive. So the brainstem is going to be composed of these two portions here, the midbrain and the hindbrain. Midbrain is the mesencephalon and it's just there to relay. It's a relay center. The cerebellum, which is the metencephalon, is there for movement control and balance and coordination. 
Although we're learning that there's actually a lot more going on in the cerebellum than we initially thought. It actually is in part involved with memories. Um, there's a little bit of learning that goes on with the cerebellum. It, it's far more complicated than we initially like to think it to be. And then the last part of the hindbrain, which is the myelencephalon or the medulla, this is actually where you get basal function, which is to say, this is the part of the brain that keeps you alive. All the other parts, yeah, they're nice and they're cute, but they're not necessarily there to keep you alive. The medulla, it's the one that says, hey, let's make sure your heart's still beating. Let's make sure you're breathing. Those sound mildly important to us. We can take the brain and divide it up into chunks, at least the, in what I see here, which is primarily cerebrum. So you have things that we call like the frontal lobe, which is where the higher order functions that we like to think of turn out to be. The parietal lobe is more of the let's control movement and let's start thinking in terms of sensations. The temporal lobe is associated with hearing and speech, or at least the processing of sound aspect of speech. And the occipital lobe is there for visual processing. If I were to take this divide right here, this central sulcus, I have what I call the pre-sulcus, or the pre, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the term. But we have this section right here that's before this central sulcus, so it's pre-sulcus. Then we have this area back here, which is after it. So that's post sulcus. And we call these either the motor cortex or the sensory cortex. In this particular case, they're saying somatosensory cortex. And we can actually view it in terms of um, these diagrams here, which are called homunculus diagrams. So what this here is showing you is what part of this cortex, so this motor cortex, is devoted towards, you know, moving your foot as opposed to moving your leg, as opposed to moving your torso and your arm, as opposed to what's in control of your hand, as opposed to what part is involved with your facial expressions, as opposed to, you know, just your tongue. And we can do the exact same thing with sensations here on the right side. So if I were to have damage to any of these parts, like if I had damage right here that I just starred, I'm going to have issues moving my hand. If I have damage here, I'm going to have issues feeling my jaw and my gums. So we know about how this plays out because people have strokes, people ha get head injuries. We can see where the damage is and we can see what results. Beyond just labeling lobes, there's also hot spots within the brain. And by hot spots, I mean active clusters of gang of cell bodies that we call nuclei. So it's not like its own little separate bubble. It's hidden within all the wires. And we can have things like the basal ganglia and the amygdala and the hippocampus. These are all involved with learning and emotions and memory. And are, we're not here to talk about trying to understand all those. But these are going to be very specific little sections. And we could also have super basic things like limbic system, which is going to be involved with emotions and learning. And then also, even more basic, the reticular formation, which actually involves the brainstem all the way up into the cerebrum. And that's going to be involved with, are you awake or are you asleep? It needs to say I'm not doing a halfway decent job walking you through the brain because, you know, this could be, you know, the entire class and we just don't have time. One of the ways that you can find out if your nerves and the brain and the spinal cord are all intact is through reflexes. Reflexes involve three or excuse me, five components. What we call is the receptor, so some type of sensor an afferent, properly pronounced afferent, but afferent or a sensory neuron to send that signal in from the receptor. 
an interneuron, which is a processor. This is either going to be in the spinal cord or it's going to be in the brain. And it's the thing that's going to say, hey, I got this signal. What should I do about it? We have the efferent or efferent or the motor neuron. So that's going to be the, hey, let's execute the plan or execute the response. And then an effector, which is going to be either a muscle or a gland, something that we're going to use as a response. A lot of reflexes turn out to be protective, meaning like a withdrawal reflex or, you know, a patellar reflex or, you know, a calcaneal reflex. They're meant to try and undo damage that may or may not be happening. It's, they're in a sense like a baby version, but the nervous system version of a negative feedback loop. The autonomic nervous system, on the other hand, deals with automatic non-conscious control you can trick yourself into thinking that you can control things like meditation can help or, you know, using various breathing techniques, but you don't get much say as to what's happening. And the autonomic nervous system is broken up into two components, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is primarily found on these little side chains that we call the sympathetic ganglia or the sympathetic chains. What you actually have is your spinal cord, and then we actually have these little sides, chains that are right next to the spinal cord, and they connect. It turns out, in order to have functioning, there are two neurons that are always required for the autonomic nervous system to do its thing. It's going to be a neuron that goes from the spinal cord to the sympathetic chain, and then from the sympathetic chain moving on out. What is it associated with? It's associated with fight or flight. Meaning, if you are scared, you need to either fight something off or you need to run away. That is what the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is involved. So if you need to run away from a bear, what are you going to do? You need to have your eyes wide open. You need to be hearing everything around you. You don't need to eat food, which means your mouth is going to dry out. You need to get rid of any excess weight that you could have in your body because it's going to slow you down. So you're going to remove feces from your body, food from your stomach, urine from your bladder. These will all be things that you will automatically do. This is in contrast to what we call the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. These come from actually two different sources. One of those sources are called cranial nerves. So at some point you will probably end up learning about the cranial nerves. So 3, 7, 9, and 10, which are the ocular motor, the facial, the glossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerve. Vagus being a V-A-G-U-S, not Las Vegas. Of all these, it's the vagus nerve that's the big deal because the vagus nerve turns out to travel everywhere in your body. So if you actually were to look at it, it's this one right here. That's the vagus nerve. And then we also have some nerves from the bottom of your spinal cord, which are the sacral nerves, which are down here, that are associated with some parasympathetic functioning. Much like with the sympathetic, they involve two neurons in order for having proper functioning. And they are dealing with rest and digest. So anything, when you think you had a big meal and you just want to fall asleep, That's what this is for. Help you fall asleep and digest your food. It's for the opposite of a sympathetic stimulation. So next time we're going to talk about how do we utilize the somatic nervous system to control how you move, which means we're going to talk about muscles.